we know we need to store at minimum the, the ID of a user, a username for example, and the password. We said that storing them as is, that is especially storing the password in the clear, is not good because if someone obtains this database of list of usernames or IDs and passwords, then they've discovered everyone's password. So that's a problem because what we should do is try and design the storage of the passwords because it's confidential information, it's important information. We should design it such that even if someone can get access to the database, it's still hard to find the password. So even if there's some flaw, some other flaw in the system such that someone can read the pa password database, it still should be hard for them to find the actual password. So we don't store it in the clear. So ID, comma, P, think of that as the, the columns in a table of our database. We don't do it like that. We said another approach was to encrypt the passwords, store the encrypted passwords. So if someone gets the database, they see the ciphertext. But the problem with this approach, although it achieves our aim that the attacker cannot find the password, we must still store the key somewhere. So our password system must have the key to be able to decrypt. And where do we store the key? Well, if it's sa stored on the same computer as the database, it may be possible for someone who gets access to the database to also get access to the key. And once they get access to the key, then they can easily decrypt. So that's not typical approach to store passwords either. Another way is to hash the passwords. <coughs> store the ID and don't store the password but a hash of the password. And we know the properties of hash functions say that if the attacker obtains this database, they can see the hash value. But the properties of our hash function should be such that if you have the hash value, you cannot go backwards and get the original password. It's this one-way property we require. So that's how the hash function helps us in this case we can uh, store it, store the password information, in this case the hash value, such that even if someone finds this, they cannot get the original password. And that's what we're trying to do, protect the passwords so that the attacker who gets the database cannot find them. And it works that to check, what we do is we, if we store the hash value, when the user submits their password to try and log in, they submit their password. The system to check the submitted value against the stored value takes the hash of the submitted value and compares to the stored value. And again, our properties of hash functions is that if the two passwords, the one stored and the one submitted, are the same, then the hash value should be the same. So we just compare hash values. If the hash values match, then login is successful. So this is one approach for storing, data, uh, storing passwords. And we looked at an example. The first one was if we store the passwords in the clear. That's not good. Then we got to the point, or this example was where we store the usernames and the hash of the passwords, not the actual passwords. And we said that if the attacker finds this database, so they have this table of information, then what the attacker tries to do is take, for example, Steve's hash value, and try and work backwards and find, well, what password led to that hash value? And there are two basic approaches. The, the, the dumb approach, the pure brute force approach, is try every possible password, random characters. And we say that on a hash function, to find the input, when we're given a hash value, Depend, the amount of effort it takes depends upon the length of the hash value. So, for example, if you use MD5 as a hash function, it produces a 128-bit hash value. So a brute force attempt requires the attacker to make 2 to the power of 128 attempts to find the password that leads to this hash value. So what they do is they try some random string, hash it. Does it match 75127? No. Then they try another random string, hash it and keep going and on average 
it will take them 2 to the power of 128 attempts to get the right one. And then we calculated if they could do that, and if they could do it at a speed of 1 billion attempts per second, 1 billion hashes per second, then the time it would take them, so if they had a computer that could run at that speed, would be 10 to the power of 21 years. Okay, so the brute force attempt doesn't work. But we, the attacker can be smarter. They, the attacker knows in most cases that the passwords that they need to try are not any random characters. They are usually of some limited length. Most passwords are, are shorter some, than some known values and even have some structure in them. So in fact they can try um, passwords of a particular length. So if we assume that the attacker knows that the passwords are limited to eight characters, just as an example, say we know that the user doesn't choose a password larger than eight characters, then what we need to try is all possible combinations of passwords which are either one character long, two, three, up until eight characters long. And that's not so many. And we calculate, okay, how many passwords are one character long? 94. How many are two characters long? 94 squared. So that's how many the attacker would need to try because the password must be in that set. How many are eight characters long? 94 to the power of eight. Where does 94 come from? What is 94 in this one, this example? 94 what? 94 was, we said, was the number of printable ASCII characters that are uh, possible on a keyboard. So if we count the uppercase, lowercase letters, numbers, the digits, plus all those punctuation characters, there's about 94 of them to choose from. So when someone chooses a password, the upper limit, they can choose from 94 different characters for each letter in their password. That's why we used that here. If you, if you knew the password was limited to just uppercase and lowercase, it would be down to 52. So, what the attacker needs to do is try up and to all of these possible passwords. One of them must produce the hash value that's stored in the database. So if they try all these, they will get the right password. And if you try all these, and we did a rough calculation, if you could try them at I increase the speed to 10 to the power of 10 per second, 10 billion times per second, it takes about seven days. So that's better than 10 to the power of 21 years. So this attack is possible, it's feasible. How do we slow, it, slow the attacker down? How do we force them to take longer? More what? Longer password. Let's m force our user to have nine characters in their password. Don't allow them to have eight or less. Force them to have nine. And that will mean we have 94 to the power of nine. So we increase by a factor of 94. 94 times more attempts needed. So 94 times seven days, which is, what, two years. Or what else can we do to slow the attacker down? Again, in this case, we, the, the attacker is doing this on their own computer. Okay? So what they've done is they've somehow downloaded the database. They've copied it to their own computer and they can use as many computer resources as they can afford to try as many attempts as possible. Okay? So this is what we call an offline attack. The attacker is not trying as they, for example, submit passwords to Hotmail. They've somehow downloaded the database of the hashes from the website or from the computer system onto their computer and then trying to break it. So we can increase the password length. That will increase the, number, the amount of time. Or what else can we do? No, assuming they've chosen a password of nine characters or eight characters, this is an issue. How many attempts can you do per second? Well, we can't force the attacker to use slower computers. They will choose as fast as possible. 
but we could try and use algorithms such that their computer would take more time per attempt. So where did I get 10 to the power of 10 hashes per second from? It depends upon, of course, the hardware, and also it depends upon the algorithm that was used for the hashing. So MD5, maybe a, a recent computer can do about 10 to the power of 10 per second, but there are other algorithms which are much slower. And that's a good thing for security, because slower to hash means it will take the attacker more time to do a brute force. What else do we get to? So this attack involves the attacker taking seven days and they find the password. <coughs> From the attacker's perspective, a better thing would be to generate all these hashes, 94 to the power of 8 possible hashes, save them, say, on a hard disk, and then the next time we want to break a hash value and find someone's password, we just look up. We don't have to recalculate all of these across seven days. We can just search through the database and we'll immediately, or within a few minutes, probably find the value. So a more, uh, from the attacker's perspective, and a, a better attack is once you've done this once, once you've found the hash values for all possible passwords of up to eight characters, store all of that information in a database, in your own local database or on a hard disk. And then when you want to break a hash value, simply look through that database for the corresponding hash value and, and then find the matching password. That can be very, very fast for the attacker. And with a, a storage of all these passwords, you can, an attacker can, instead of taking seven days to calculate all the hash values, they can just look up through the, the stored values and find it with, people say, in the order of minutes, maybe hours in the worst case. So calculating hashes is much, much slower than searching through a table or a database for particular values, doing a lookup. So in fact, once someone does this, and people have done this, they calculate all the hashes, save it on a hard disk, and then sell the hard disk to other people who want to break the passwords. And that can be done then, in, once you have the hard disk, you can break passwords in minutes or hours, in the worst case. Therefore, our storage of passwords is not very secure. If someone can, can find my password in minutes or hours, then it's not, not very secure. Now the problem with that is that storing passwords, we said there are about 94 to the power of 8 passwords. If one password is 8 bytes, 8 characters, 8 bytes, one hash for MD5 is 128 bits, or 16 bytes, for every value we need to store 24 bytes. The attacker needs to store 24 bytes, which is about 146,000 terabytes in total. So an attack that involves storing all of this data can speed up the attack from seven days down to minutes, but it's at the expense of requiring a lot of storage. Anyone have a hard disk or hard disks for this? No, not good for the attacker's perspective. And that's almost where we got to last week. It turns out that people have devised really compression schemes to instead of saving the raw data, like 146,000 terabytes, algorithms to save all of this data in a much, much more condensed space in the order of half a terabyte. 576 gigabytes is an example of someone who's, who sells this database, really, of password hashes. You can buy a hard disk with all of these values on there, and then what the attacker does, instead of spending seven days calculating the hash, they just search through the database of that 500 gigabytes and they find the, the password within a matter of minutes, hours in the worst case. So there are ways to make the attack fast and the amount of storage space manageable. Half a terabyte is manageable.
So storing a hash still is not, not the best solution because there are ways for attackers to, within reasonable time and reasonable storage space, find the password given the hash value. What they do, the attacker does, is they buy a hard disk with pre-calculated hash values. That is, someone else has done it for them. Someone else has spent seven days or months calculating the hashes, save it on a hard disk, and then they sell it to the next person, the next attacker, who then just looks through that database, which is much, much faster than calculating. And the way that the data, the, the hashes are stored, the data structure that manages the compression are called rainbow tables. We're not going to study how they work, it's not that, but you may hear them uh, when, when you come across password attacks. The idea is that by storing the pre-calculated hash values for the attacker, it reduces the search time from, say, seven days down to minutes or hours, but at the expense of you need more storage space. But a few terabytes is not a problem nowadays of storage space. So the attacks are practical in this case. So we need a new way or a better way to store passwords than just the hash value. And the different approaches, the countermeasures are the, the things to stop those attacks require the user to have longer passwords, nine characters, ten characters, and so on. What's the problem? What's the problem with longer passwords? Inconvenient. Okay, so if we can require the user to have 15 character passwords, that's good for security, but not so good for the convenience of the user. The other thing is to use slower hash algorithms. Choose an algorithm Instead of MD5, choose an algorithm that would make the attacker take a long time to calculate the hashes. Again, I said, I gave an example of 10 to the power of 10 per second. If we use an algorithm that reduces the time, uh, increases the time it takes to attack, then that's better for security. And there are some algorithms that are designed to be actually slow. Slow in terms of maybe it takes half a second to do uh, um, a hash, as opposed to milliseconds or microseconds. And the last one, and, and the one that we're leading to, sometimes we cannot change a hash algorithms, sometimes we're limited to the algorithms available, is to add some salt. It's called salting the password, which is just the name. The concept is we introduce another random number before we hash. So we'll look at that, and that's actually the final way, the recommended way for storing passwords. So the solution is to store the ID of the user, to choose a random number, and we'll call it a salt, but some S-bit random number. And the computer system chooses that, not the user. So when the user registers their password, they first create an account, the system stores or creates and stores a S-bit random value, which we call a salt. And when we hash the password, we don't just hash the password on its own, we hash the password combined with the salt. The salt is a random value, so sequence of bits, uh, a number. Okay? We can represent it in different formats, of course. So what happens is when now when you create your account, instead of just storing the hash of your password, the computer system generates a random value for you. It doesn't tell you the value, you don't need to know it. But it generates and stores that random value called the salt and it hashes the password combined with the salt. Do we have a picture of this? Maybe I do.
That's not the one. Here's an example of that storage of information so that what happens, the, the registration process before we start logins, by registration I mean when a user creates an account, the user chooses a password that's what the user does but the system generates a random salt so this is different from the normal registration procedure so when you create your account, maybe you've got a username, you choose your own password, and when that happens, the system generates some random value, we call it a salt. Here I've listed the random values just as characters, but that we can map them back to binary using some encoding, ASCII encoding for example. So when John chose his password, the system chose a random salt, and then the system calculated the hash of the password combined with the salt. Okay, just concatenate the two, so whatever password John chose, attach the salt to it, hash it, and you get a hash value. And when Sandy chose her password, the system chooses a different random value, it's random and it's per user, and again, when the hash value is created, it's created based upon the password combined with the salt. When a user logs in, so after they've registered, they make a login attempt. Then what happens is that they submit their username and password that's the normal approach and then the system takes the submitted password and combines it with the stored salt value and if they match the stored hash value it's correct this is the submitted value So when a user logs in, they submit their username and password. The system looks up the username in their database. They find username Steve. They take the submitted password, the one I typed in when I tried to log in. They combine it with my stored salt value, concatenate them. Take a hash of that. When we take a hash of that, we get some hash value and then simply compare it to this 184B7 hash value. If it's the same, login successful. If they are different, login fails. So that's how the registration and login works. We need to look at why is it more secure. Any questions on how it works before we look at why is it more secure? 
common it's a it's a common thing that people use when they implement uh, password storage on websites on on computer systems so it's important to know how uh, how to do it it's even also nice to know why to do it why is this better than not using a salt that's what we want to know well let's summarize what not using the salt was uh, A problem with it. When we didn't use a salt, it was possible for the attacker to pre calculate all the hash values for some reasonable set of passwords. For example, within a terabyte, you can store the hash values for all passwords of up to eight characters long. And then it's possible for the attacker just to look up the hash value in that database within minutes or hours in the worst case and find the corresponding password. That's if we don't use a salt. So let's write some of those numbers down because we'll use them in the example. Let's assume the attacker as a database or a disk when I mean say database it can be stored in any manner it could be a, a file just some data structure but a set of data of what 94 when we come back to ours 94 to the power of 8 uh, rows each row contains a password and a hash of that password. That takes, with rainbow tables, about 500 gigabytes to store. And about, let's uh, say, minutes to find password. That is, let's assume the attacker has this hard disk, about half a terabyte, and on it, it stores information of a list of all possible passwords of up to eight characters. We're limited to that in this example. And the corresponding hash values of those passwords. So what the attacker uses this for is that when they know a hash value, they just search through, find the hash value in that column. Once they've found that, they've found the corresponding password. And such searches can be quite fast, in the order of minutes in practice. So the attacker can find a password quite quickly. That's the normal approach of the attacker when we just store the hash of the password. But now what we're doing is storing a hash of the password in the salt. What does the attacker need to do now? Think from the perspective you're trying to find a password of someone given a hash value. What do you need to do? Any ideas? Find the key for the hash. What key? No key in this one. The normal attack involves the, the attacker looking through its own database. It's got stored on disk and it's got stored a hash value and it compares the hash value to what's stored and then once it matches, finds the password. That doesn't take long. By introducing a salt, this random va value, then what it results is that the attacker would need a database that was created for the particular salt value that is used for that user. For example, 
The salt value for John was this random set of characters. For the attacker to use its own pre-calculated database, the database must have been created for that particular salt value. If they want to find the password for Sandy, they need a database that was created with this salt value in mind. If they want to find my password, they, the attacker needs a database which was calculated using this salt value. In general, for the attacker to su succeed now, they need a database for every possible salt value because they don't know what the salt value will be in advance. And see what requirements that places on the attacker. When the system chooses a random salt value to store with the, the password and to include in the hash, what the attacker needs to do now is to do this quick or fast lookup, which takes minutes, they must have a database for the corresponding salt value. So in general, since they do not know what the salt value is in advance, they should have a database for every possible salt value. So, for example, what if the salt value was uh, 32 bits in length? It was a random number, 32 bits. With a 32-bit random number, the number of possible values is 2 to the power of 32. Therefore, for the attacker to be able to do this lookup in their database, they should have one database for the first salt value, one for the second, one for the third, and one for all of the 2 to the power of 32 possible salt values. If they do that, then they can still find the password within a matter of minutes. But that's greatly increased their storage requirements. One database was half a terabyte. Two to the power of 32 is four billion. So now they need, what, two billion terabytes of storage space for this to work, which is not possible. So the idea of introducing the salt is to make it hard for the attacker to do this attack where they use a pre-calculated hash value stored in a database. Without a salt, they can have a database, half a terabyte is not a problem, and they can find the password in a matter of minutes. With a salt, the attacker would need a database for every possible salt value. So if, for example, we have a salt of 32 bits, they'd need 2 to the power of 32 different databases. That's not possible to store because that's uh, billions of terabytes. That's why we introduce a salt value, which is just a random number, which is stored with the password and hashed with the password. That's hard to get your head around, I know. It takes a lot of thinking about uh, the different things that the attacker can do. If you cannot capture all of that, at least always remember we don't just store the hash of a password, we store the hash of a password combined with a random number where we call that random number the salt value. The salt value is known and stored in the database 
It prevents the use of pre-calculated databases because it makes the storage requirements too, too large. The space required increased by a factor of 2 to the s, 2 to the power of s, where s is the number of bits in our salt. So all you need to do is make the salt a reasonable length, 32 bits, 64 bits, and the attacker can no longer use that pre-calculated li list of databases. Questions? Before we try and finish this part on passwords. Know why not to store the password in the clear? Why in practice we don't just encrypt the password? Storing the key is a, a problem then. So therefore why hashes work? And also try to remember that we don't just store the hash of the password but the hash of the password combined with a random number. <coughs> so when you implement, say, a database for your new website and there's a user login system, then in your database somewhere you would store this information. The username, the password they chose but not stored in the clear, choose a random number for that user called the salt, store that, and hash the password combined with the salt. Note that the attacker does know the salt value. If the attacker obtains the database, they do learn the actual salt value. So the salt doesn't make it any harder for the attacker to do and do that seven day attack and try all the passwords again. They can do that. But it makes it harder for them to use a database that was calculated in the past and quickly find the password within a matter of minutes. So the salt only prevents the use of pre-calculated hash values stored in databases. It doesn't stop the attacker just from recalculating the hashes. So the attacker in this case can still do an attack which is successful in what we said our seven days, the time to calculate 94 to the power of 8 possible hash values. But they can't do it in a matter of minutes because they don't have all the values stored. There are some other things about storing passwords. The recommended ways, uh, the basic way to store passwords is summarized here, but there are other modifications to storing which we will not get into. But basically store the ID, a random salt, and hash the password combined with the salt. What should the salt be? Random. It's generated by the system when the user creates their account. The user doesn't need to know it. 32 bits or longer is usually recommended. Some will see a, a much longer. What hash function to use? You want a slow hash function such that having it slow means the attacker will take a long time to make many attempts. If it's a very, very fast function, it, then they can do more attempts per second. And there are hash functions which are, uh, which are designed to be adaptive in speed. That is, you can add a parameter to slow it down, the work factor. So they are recommended to be used. Some are listed there. And another important thing, and what we've assumed all, all along, is that when you're designing your password storage scheme, assume someone will get your database. Right? You want to protect your database so that no one can access it, but you should design your storage such that well, what happens in the future if someone does get my database? That's why we don't store them in the clear. Assume that something will go wrong in the future and someone will get access to your database, so you want to make it such that it's still hard for the attacker to find the passwords. Designed for failure.
we'll look at an example just briefly. Uh, here's my one of my virtual machines which has a set of users. Can you see? It's not quite. Okay. Let's see the users on here. I may have to zoom out. Remember the password file is that stores user information. And this one has a set of users already on this computer. So this is the password database. Well, not exactly because it doesn't store the password information. This is the user database, username or the ID, some user information. This X field here actually means there's another file that contains the password information. And the other file is the shadow file. And that's the first security mechanism. Provide access control that the users who are not allowed to cannot access this file. But what happens if we make a mistake or some user that gets permissions can access the file? And since I have permissions, I can look at it. Now we can see this is the actual password database. Looks confusing. Let's just grab one line and look at it in detail. There's one line. So each user has this information. Let's just look at the structure of this. The fields, the first set of fields are separated by the colon character here. So we have a username. There's the user ID. We have this long field here, which we'll look at in depth. That's actually the, the hash value plus some other information. Then the, these numbers at the, the, at the end are something about when was the last password change and about some information about when uh, the next password change should be. So the system can store some information about how many days or how many minutes before you need to, uh, where you prompted for a new password. Some systems will require you to change the password. We'll ignore those numbers for now. Just look at, there's the username. And then this information. It's actually split into three subfields, separated by the dollar signs. It's hard to see, but there's this. Number six is one field. This value is the second field. And this is the hash value, this long one. Of those three fields, the number six indicates the hash algorithm used. Our system can choose from different hash algorithms. Six, and you can look up the data, six refers to using SHA, the hash algorithm called SHA, with a 512-bit hash value. So our system actually stores that this user, we use the algorithm SHA 512. That's what six means there. What's the next value? What's this? That's the salt. That's some random number that my uh, operating system chose when this user created their account. And it's stored here. The format that it's stored, it's just encoded in some modified ASCII form. It's not actually ASCII, it's uh, slightly different. But just think of it as a binary value. Uh, but of course, to show it on the screen and save it in a text file, we, we have it as a set of characters. So that's the salt. And this is the hash value. 
So again, a random uh, looking value which was obtained by taking the user's password, combining it with this salt, and hashing it with SHA-512. That's the algorithm. And we store just this. So that now when someone can access this database, their challenge is to take this hash value and go backwards and find the password. And that takes a lot of effort. With a 512-bit hash value, it takes 2 to the power of 512 operations. We calculated, assuming that they have a, a good password, we calculated that 2 to the power of 128 would take 10 to the power of 21 years. So a brute force attack is not going to work here. But of course, the attacker can try passwords of the length that they think the, the user chose. Okay, eight character passwords, for example. So that's just an example on a Linux system, the, the storage of the password database. It's not a SQL database, it's just a, a plain text file, but that stores the user ID, the salt, and it also stores the algorithm. When you can have multiple algorithms, you should store which one, and the hash value. Any questions before we finish on password storage? Try and look on your computer and find the, the database that stores the passwords, whether it's uh, a Mac or Windows, there's some storage of the password information.